So, um, like I said, we welcome people um, sharing thoughts, um, anything that comes up for you, reflections, relevant resources, questions in the chat throughout the session. A little bit later on, we'll invite you to join breakout rooms to discuss some of the key themes that are coming up. There'll be jam boards provided so that you can add any thoughts and comments that can be reflected on in the discussion towards the end of the session. Um, so I'll introduce the speakers now if you're all ready. Or would you like another couple of minutes to get the screen sorted? We can't, I can't get the screen yeah, working. We'll. It's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with the laptop um, because I'm being asked to put in lots of security codes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Frustrating, yeah. <laughs> it is a bit. Yeah. Okay, well, we're really looking forward to the session. Um, small screen is fine. Um, we're joined by <laughs> Louise Warwick Booth, Susan Curran, and Ruth Cross, and they're going to lead us in an interactive conversation about the mental health impacts of co produced research projects within university community research partnerships. Louise, Susan, and Ruth are joining us from the Centre for Health Promotion Research at Leeds Beckett University, and that centre maybe you'll explain a little bit more to us as we go along but that center aims to develop collaborative research to advance the evidence for health promotion through practice-based research with a particular focus on practice within communities so yeah really looking forward to hearing from you now okay so i will share my screen and you can hopefully then see my slides um that bit seems to be working okay um so move that a little bit so I can do my slideshow. Um, okay, everyone see that okay? Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Brilliant. So we're aware of time. So this is obviously the title of our um yeah, uh, under recognized emotional labor. And we want to talk to you um today about um actually move that slides on so then you can see today's plan. Um, our experiences of researching in, in co-productive ways in the context of research and community partnerships. Um, we've probably put too much into this um, seminar because we've, we, for us, we've identified two themes from this sort of work that we've been doing over a number of years. Um, and we're interested um, in everyone else's viewpoints, there'll be time for discussion around if their experiences are the same as ours as well, in terms of sort of researcher well-being um, and mental health, as well as kind of tensions in co-productive approaches to research um, that come from stakeholders, um, rather than just kind of, you know, the first theme is thinking about, um, you know, how we work with participants and the impact upon us emotionally. Um, and then the second theme is more about kind of, you know, those power dynamics, um, that, that are at play when you're working in co-production um, and lots of sort of vested interests. Um, so yeah, that's our plan. Um, so I guess as a starting point, what we're gonna do is kind of cover how we work and then we're gonna delve a little bit more into each of those themes and then allow some time for chat. So I hope that all sounds okay. I hope it sounds like that is what everyone was expecting today and that you're in the right place too. Um, okay, so. I'll hand over to Susan, who's going to talk about our ways of working. Yeah, I'm very briefly going to go through our ways of working. So you do have questions later or indeed after the session, you can, you're can you very welcome to get in touch with us. Um, so co-production principles inform all of our practice, really. It's an approach that aligns with participatory goals. Um, it involves participants working together on equal footing, so whether that's um, academics or experts by experience, working together without privileging a, a single viewpoint. Uh, our methods range according to um, each project requirements, stakeholder need, the types of communities that we're working with. Always very, very flexible and shifting. So within a project, we might have to amend things along the way to fit with, with people's needs and capabilities and interests. Um, the people, the, particularly women, when we were working in women-centered work and service users in general at the center of the research approach, um, taking into account people's different levels of literacy or use of English or um, the sensitivity of the research topic. Our work's underpinned by feminist pr principles. We're all proud feminists here. And again, that's a lot about um, tackling that power dynamic as, as middle-class, uh, middle-aged women from the university um, going out into different types of communities. Uh, we use 
mainly qualitative approaches to really allow the exploration of people's experiences. Um, generally focus groups, interviews, case studies. We've done quite a lot of work, uh, peer research, community research, training up community members to do research with and in their communities. Uh, creative methods are a really important part of this because they allow people to express themselves in different ways. We've got a picture there of one of my favourites of the <laughs> um, metaphor of making a cake. So this is for a programme evaluation of asking people what was essential, um, what what was the, the core ingredients to make that programme work and what were the added extras, the, the icing, the cherry on the top. So we find this way to put people at ease and find different ways to, to get people to, to tell us what they think about things. Um, again, we're more than happy to go into this at length, but it's just a real quick overview to start off. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So if it's it's kind of like quite a broad scope of work, actually, in terms of um, what we've done. And um, much of the work is around gender, as Susan has said. It's also involved, you know, kind of that uh, we've put this in inverted commas on this slide in terms of marginalised and vulnerable community members, because they're not our terms, but the terms that are understood um, in the wider literature and used by researchers really um, working in this area. Um, much of our work um, is very applied. It's in the voluntary and community um, sector. Um, so we're often, like Susan says, evaluating you know, specific programme interventions. Um, and so we've done a list here of this, just the gendered interventions that, that we've done over the last um, 10 years. Um, most of those, um, aside from the final bullet point that talks about the NHS um, FGM clinics, the rest of this work has been in um, the voluntary and community sector um, and we've put some examples of kind of our publications around um, this slide as well so we've written on our methods as well as um, written about kind of you know do the interventions work and then um, a recent article that that um, we wrote about kind of co-production and, and what service users sort of think of that to an extent as well and the kind of you know lovely title there about you know it really intimates that they don't necessarily care not in a negative way but in a way that um, what's important to them is perhaps not what is important to us as researchers and I think that's important in remembering um, when we're working in, in co-productive ways. Um, so that is an absolute like whistle stop talk. <laughs> um, 10 years in two minutes, I think. <laughs> so as Susan said, if, if people have more detailed questions, you can come back to us um, later on and we're always happy to sort of answer emails as well. But we want to spend most of the time that we've got now kind of talking in detail about um, what this practice and this kind of research means around those themes that we've identified around researcher well-being and then also um, around um, kind of power dynamics and, and the implications of, of those things for us as researchers. So I will move on and then I think Ruth's going to talk to you about our first theme which is published in this lovely little book that we've got a picture on recently. Thanks, Louise. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about researcher well-being in the context of our own experiences. Um, and to start with, this is about validating and understanding some of the impact of being a researcher working with vulnerable groups. Many of the women that we have worked with and the young girls have a history of trauma mm -hmm. and they bring that to the research transaction. So what we experienced as a research is we're calling emotional labour. Um, and this is referring to maybe vicarious trauma, secondary mm -hmm. traumatic stress, basically being affected by other people's stories and experiences, either through emotional contagion, uh, mirroring emotional states or our empathetic, sympathetic responses, or by perhaps even by being triggered ourselves, having had similar experiences or memories. So in our experience, the onus has been very much on us as the researchers to self-care and to process those experiences on our own, um, which leads to a risk of burnout, um, ambivalence, even compassion fatigue. Um, and we see a lot of repeated stories with the women that we work with and that, um, that we co-produce our research with, um, their histories of tra trauma, there's some similar themes. Um, there's possibly an increased risk of that um, secondary trauma stress that's experienced because of the nature of the people that we're working with. But there's also an increased risk when you think about involving P 
peer researchers, as co-producers of knowledge, because they've often been through similar experiences themselves. Um, so we, we talk about reflexivity as being an absolutely essential component of qualitative research, but a question, one of the questions we're asking today is, is that enough? Um, it's always important, but what do you do with that emotional load? Where do you put it? How do you deal with it? How does it get discharged? Sometimes that's through um, debriefing with colleagues, sometimes through um, debriefing with significant others. We've all gone home and metaphorically kicked the cat. Um, but however we do it, it seems to be very much predicated on that individual level coping mechanism mentality. So we don't seem to have the structural and institutional support in place to um, enable colleagues to um, deal with these kind of things. So they're effective components of all that co-productive co work. It kind of links with the second theme that Lu Louise is going to talk about in a minute. Um, so we're going to be asking some of these questions a bit later, like what would a supportive system look like? Because um, at the moment we don't feel like we're sort of working in one necessarily. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's how do we deal with the, that emotional fallout of interacting with, with people, human beings who've experienced trauma that they then bring into their storytelling of their lives and how we then respond to that, how we deal with it and um, how we can basically be better at what we're doing in trying to support those women in those circumstances. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, lots of questions raised and um, in thinking about the reflexivity actually um, Ruth organized a, a speaker to come to the university this was this was before Covid so right. we had a lovely in-person yeah BC we had a lovely in-person seminar where they were talking about using reflexivity for emotional coping um, and it was great and, and I think there were some nice tips in there but we are left with that sort of sense of this isn't necessarily enough um, that, that Ruth has said and, and actually questions about the university systems and I remember being um, daring to raise that in that meeting at the end in the question and answers um, part of that seminar um, and just sort of saying you know the ethics is really really great on supporting participant well-being and um, I think we've got that um, really well managed um, around safeguarding of participants but what about us as staff and I was shot down by a really senior colleague who said the university has systems in place Louise and, and um, I, I, I remained quiet <laughs> after that um, so there's an interesting power dynamic there um, yeah so on that note of sort of power dynamics and systems and institutions I'll move us on to our next um, theme um, here that we wanted to talk about. So we've just submitted a paper um, to evidence and policy um, about co-producing evaluation and kind of uh, knowledge and power dynamics. Um, and we based this paper um, on our experiences of working across three, three of those evaluations that, that we've mentioned at the start. Um, and each of those evaluations, we worked in a co-productive way. So we um, kind of submitted very um, relatively open proposals and then worked with our commissioners um, to sort of develop our methods and, you know, open to conversations and discussions around how we might run each evaluation and the ways in which we could work with people. Um, and interestingly, um, even though we feel like we're working in quite inclusive ways for participants and for um, stakeholders who are involved, um, we face challenge in, in these three projects um, and significant challenge. So this is not just about, you know, we're not happy with a slight wording in the final report. This, is, this runs much deeper than that. So in the, fir the first sort of challenge um, was in a, in a project where we were asked to um, produce um, some data in the final report that, um, and some analysis of, of internal data and the commissioner would not supply us with that data. So how did we then do that analysis? It's not possible, is it? Um, and we asked politely, we thought that perhaps um, they might be having staffing challenges. So um, we, we wrote to them and said, oh, OK, um, do you want us to sort of come in and do you want to see us look at the data on your systems and how we might work with it? We'll come to your premises. Um, and we just um, we were never granted that access. Um, and when um, 
we sent in the final report we left that sort of the, you know the section where that data was needed I remember leaving that section blank mm. and Ruth and I went to the meeting together to sort of discuss this final report and that's the first thing that was raised in that sort of meeting with lots of people from external agencies well where's this data and it was I can't remember how I even dealt with it now I can't remember what my response was I know it was stressful I know we felt powerless uh, mm. you know and we didn't know sort of how to handle it and eventually the report was finalized but without that data um and the dynamics have sort of been asked to do something that you can't do um yeah how do you manage that and and you know um I think we had a research manager at the time actually who was really good at relational work and I took her with me separately so that the, the commissioner had never met her and I took her with me and she sort of said oh we'll run an event and do some dissemination stuff and that's just smooth the waters but that wasn't my idea I felt sort of you know um a little bit out of my depth um, on that one. Then the second example is around um, another one of those um, evaluations where it was issues with staff aggression towards us. Again, not service users, you know, with challenging um, life circumstances where um, we were commissioned to produce um, a qualitative evaluation, which we did. Um, and there'd been some internal challenges that we were aware of in their delivery processes. Um, and we'd, um, Susan and I did a focus group that was emotionally intense, I will say, and um, <laughs> was, yeah, uh, hard going two hours emotionally for us. Um, and that was the staff who were quite verbally aggressive. And then that, that translated into email communications. When we sent in the final report, um, which had, we'd agreed a template that'd seen various drafts of the data, you, we are not getting value for money on what you've produced. Where is the hard data? Well, you've commissioned us and contracted us to provide a qualitative evaluation, which is what we've done. Um, we were then, um, so we had lots of criticism. Um, I tried to be really measured in my communication back and the waters did calm. Um, but the final dissemination, um, we were excluded from. There was, this commissioner had held regular events throughout, which we had, I'd gone to and presented um, at those events and talked to people and talked to different um, organisations who were involved. So it had been quite inclusive and then we were just completely cut off um, from being involved and given, we didn't have space to speak about the research process. And I'm galloping because I mean, <laughs> the time is kind of flying um, and probably too many examples. But I think the third example, um, we were working with community data um, that had been collected by the community. Um, and um, that was seen as very biased. Um, so um, difficult issue in the sense that when we were commissioned to work with this data, Susan and I came in at quite a late point when much of the community data collection had taken place. However, there was a little bit of data collection still ongoing. So I went to um, an event. We were collecting data through community events, observed the processes, saw what was happening. And then we were given um, lots and lots of data, actually some of it in note form in a bag, mm -hmm. uh, real sort of community, you know, notes. Um, and we analysed that and produced a report. Our findings based on kind of good sort of community-based research um, were really, really criticised um, by people in power locally because they did not like what the community had said about an intervention that was taking place. Um, as an independent researcher looking in, um, at everything that was going on, what the community said I felt was very fair. It wasn't particularly critical of um, this, this was an evaluation um, I'm trying to speak about it without being making it identifiable. So it's quite challenging to sort of give you much quite a polarizing topic. It was. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was a, a quite a stigmatized topic, too. So I think all of that plays into it. Um, and the result of this was because um, and there'd been some separate research with this. It wasn't contradictory, the findings of that report to our report. Um, but it, it was a different focus. OK, so it focused more on stakeholder views rather than community views. Um, but the, the result of that was that someone in power um, reported um, myself to the VC and said that I had accepted a bribe to, to lie on this report about the data, um, which, um, no, I, I, I haven't told folks on the report about the data. I've done analysis of what I've been provided with. And that's not to say that there wasn't bias in some of that data, because no research is perfect, but that had huge implications. Um, professionally um in terms of kind of you know um 
yeah, and the media were all over this issue at the time. So Susan and I were lent on quite heavily by our legal department around. We had emails um, harvested and shared in freedom of information requests. Um, and it was difficult and it was very, very stressful. And I don't mind sharing that I lost sleep about that. Mm. Um, and I wasn't, um, I think Susan was the same person on that project and I was less sane and much more stressed. I think we switched those roles. <laughs> and on each project, which we interchange. Um, but yeah, I think all of the, these little political things that are going on and power dynamics um, and vested interests and tensions where people want to get interventions refunded and perhaps our research doesn't necessarily help with that or doesn't quite say what they want it to say. And then in working in co-productive ways, do we, in trying to afford more power to people, does that then raise more challenge for us as researchers because we're seen as very friendly and nice people who will help them in their endeavours, but actually we are those independent researchers with a critical stance still. Um, so there's all those things um, at play um, and the university has really not supported us in dealing with any of those challenges. We've supported ourselves um, and supported each other as, as peers. Um, but again, that's sort of one of the things we want to talk to you about and ask your experiences about you know, does this resonate? And yeah, um, what about your well-being if you've had similar um, experiences? Um, so we've listed some questions for breakout rooms um, so that, um, yeah, we can all discuss or you can discuss something. Thank you everyone for kind of, you know, chatting about our questions um, and writing things on the jam boards um, as well in answer to um, these questions. We've had a little spy while you were chatting and filling in those jam boards so we could see what you were doing. And, and it was interesting. We were saying, oh, goodness, you know, there was different examples of things that don't happen at our institution. Um, and I guess we tend to work a little bit in silos. Um, so, yeah. Um, so these are our suggestions. So I'll just take you through those first and then, I can, yeah. Um, what we suggested in this paper that we've got under review at the moment is, um, you know, we need more research in this area about researcher experiences, um, because particularly around emotions, um, and I think there are, you know, there is certainly um, developing work in the social sciences around emotions. I know that there's, you know, there's a whole sociology of emotions, for example. Um, but I think um, the way that we publish tends to be about positive experiences and it tends to be about kind of positive study findings or you know, sometimes negative findings. But actually, it's it's not focused. It's focused on what we found rather than process and experiences of that process. Um, so we need more sort of um, publication and more ideas and more kind of yeah uh, around this. Um, I think we need to think about safe spaces for difficult conversations. One of the things that um, is challenging often is emails and we are all tending to work more remotely. Um, um, and um, if we're firing off emails, then sometimes the language that we use um, is perhaps not, you know, can be misinterpreted and misunderstood. And equally, we can take on board messages from other people in that same vein. Um, yeah, um, Susan and I have had conversations about how we read emails um, with tones in our head. And they may not be intended in that way at all, but sometimes, yeah. So if there are challenges, we think it's important to have those difficult conversations in a safe space, sort of, you know, but um, not on email, certainly. Um, we also um, reflected on language that, that perhaps we use in, in, in our reporting. Um, and thinking of ways in which to 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 write that perhaps are um, more supportive and and seen as less antagonistic. So if something doesn't work, how do we write that up? Um, what words do we use? Um, yeah, if there are areas for improvement or areas for development, or you know, there's certain words that have really negative connotations. So I think there's a responsibility on us around that as well. And then also in terms of support for. Um, ourselves we, we wondered about a, maybe a clinical supervision model um, as well because um, yeah there isn't space for debrief formally I'm not saying that will be needed every time but certainly um, you know working in practice if you were um, working in practice you would have access to some form of clinical supervision when you were dealing with such challenging issues if you're managing a caseload of complex need for example in the voluntary community sector that would be kind of its standard practice and external clinical supervision usually as well mm -hmm. um, Susan and Ruth and I have seen that rather than having someone who's more sort of um, 
yeah, au fait with your institution um, as well. So there, there are suggestions. Um, I guess if anyone wants to feed in at this point, um, kind of one key point from, from, if you have a key suggestion, one from each group, we could take that before we round up. Is there something, oh, I'm just, yeah, there's something in the chat, that's what I can't, yeah. Uh, how to best create safe spaces. Um, I guess you could use with sort of like mediation. Um, do you need somebody independent? I know that in the past when I've brought, it wasn't someone independent, but someone different, wearing a different hat, that's helped. Someone less emotionally invested. If you've worked really hard um, on a piece of work, you're invested as much as they're invested wanting good research findings. And it, it can feel personal and critique a, yeah. a, around reporting. Yeah. Um, I think it's also something in set, setting up any co-production or setting up any research. Mm -hmm project if you have those conversations to start with that we're open to having constructive mm -hmm. criticism and feedback that's quite frank mm -hmm. but um yeah we, we want to have it in a safe space you know you, we can say things politely and respectfully and both listen to or listen mm -hmm. to each other's points of view so I think it's in how you set up those relationships as well mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea of brave spaces in the chat, that's fascinating. Yeah, you're probably right, because yeah. difficult conversations, actually, is what we're talking about, isn't it? And it's challenging and quite stressful for everyone, you know, and we've, um, we haven't gone into the detail, but you can, when people are um, commissioning research or, you know, you're evaluating their organisation, um, it's hard for them too, isn't it? Mm. It's not just it's hard yeah. for us. So I think, and that all plays into mm. Yeah, those sorts of emotions that underpin, yeah, what happens. Um, yeah, yeah. Can you deliver a safe space? I don't know. Someone, yeah. Right, I love the idea of clinical supervision. Yeah. And I think that should be costed into yeah. funding as well. Yeah. Like research funding. Yeah. Lived experience and having training and knowledge in the area. Yeah. It can be much harder in academia. Yeah. And that final point, Amy. I think um, the examples of the projects we've, we've you know kind of very briefly talked about today have been really challenging but we have had some really wonderful projects so I don't want to kind of end on a really oh god everything's awful <laughs> if you do co-production because it's not but I just think that this is under discussed and um in the wake of um you know as all working in academia that final point um it's challenging isn't it a lot of us are carrying heavy workloads there's pressure to achieve there's pressure for outputs there's all of that stuff going on in the background people in practice are having various pressures too so all this stuff is not likely I think to, to, to go away so um yeah um yeah uh and I think it's important to think about it for the future you can have some really really good projects um but as I say um I, I think yeah we wanted to talk about the more challenging side of things um yeah I like that idea of kind of structuring contracts so people have safe space in their schedules um I just wonder if that's physically possible I certainly know from our own point of view if you looked at Ruth's deployment and you looked at my deployment you would cry <laughs> there isn't space within that um for anything um at all yeah um, we're still reading comments yeah, yeah. professional services staff yeah definitely mm. we we have a fantastic school secretary that has helped me out on quite a few community projects and she's exposed to things that mm. are very much out of her remit not in a normal job of mm. um things that people come with challenges and, mm. and difficult and she takes it all in her stride but there should be space for her to have yeah these conversations too yeah um yeah the ways to process emotions and de-stress yeah spending time in nature yeah and I think these are things that individually we might do ourselves but there isn't yeah. the sort of supportive system so so we would check in with each um and I'm swimming nice I would sink um but um, <laughs> we check in with each other and say what are you going to do if we've had something challenging what are you going to do to look after yourself and we might send so it becomes you know it's, it extends beyond kind of professional relationships really are you okay tonight do you need a chat do you what are you going to do are you going to you know um I sometimes do crafting um I like to stick and glue because it just absorbs me um so on and so forth um Ruth will be pounding it out in the gym <laughs> so we've all got different you know approaches um and I think you can do that but like Ruth says there's still that risk of burnout so it's that we're, we're thinking about systems and institutions as and well. And recognition that yeah. it's a part of it that yeah. from uh, yeah. management and from yeah. funding bodies and from commissioners. Yes yeah. so. absolutely because it's that almost like oh you're okay 
Uh, and when you do this work and you've done this work for a, a length of time, um, what's happened with us is that, you know, kind of people are aware of the sensitive nature of it and they'll go, oh, was it all right then? So, you know, like that was OK, wasn't it? Because you're used to it. Mm. Well, is that the right approach equally? Because I might be used to hearing those same stories that Ruth talked about, but that doesn't mean it, you know. Um, it's not upsetting in, in some ways as well um, yeah so they're the references to all the things that we've sort of written about in this area um, and yeah we'll, we'll, we're aware of time um, so we don't know if anyone's got any further questions which sort of you know but a whole four minutes left <laughs> Shall I? our emails are on this here as well so if anyone does kind of want to yeah communicate with us do feel free um, yeah we love the sound of these well-being days yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need one <laughs> And, and debriefs yeah yeah and I do think the debrief should be in the diary and cancel if need mm. be as opposed to yeah. specifically mm. having to put them in the diary when you need it mm. because we don't yeah yeah well-being days yes please yeah mm -hmm. I know can I can I just say thank you for this for creating this space for us because it's been so fascinating to to think through what can be done at an institutional level and what we can do as teams to support ourselves and our colleagues as well but yeah, especially to reflect, I think, on the institutional provision of, of support around emotional labour. So thank you. I, I really enjoy being in my group. So thanks to my group as well. Um, I think we're going to wrap up now, unless anybody would like to put any final comments in the chat and we'll take a look at those. Before you head off, Katie's going to put um, the feedback poll. Um, which will pop up on the screen apparently so if we could all take there we go if we could all take um, a minute to answer that before you leave that would be fantastic because it then helps us to plan and run the sessions in the future um, yeah so just a huge thank you to you all for joining us we really appreciate it it's been great so thank you and goodbye everyone we shall see you at the next session thank you thank you, thank you for listening to us bye bye, bye. bye.